Hello again, everyone. Tim Vollmer here. So, how do we incorporate an ethical framework into text data mining in the humanities? As we've seen, privacy protections will only get us so far. As Todd Suomela and his colleagues said in their Gamergate paper, quote, humanists are not used to thinking ethically about research subjects because we mostly deal with either subjects who are dead or subjects that are public figures like authors, politicians, or other humanists whose roles and activities are open to scrutiny and debate. The real or potential harms inflicted by research methods on these subjects are often intangible and hard to measure. So we're going to explore two key ethics questions by surfacing theory through case studies and scholarly literature. First, we learned from the privacy videos that when public data is being collected and republished for TDM purposes, it isn't necessarily protected by privacy statutes. So, in the absence of privacy law requirements, to what degree of care should we treat TDM data? Second, if the current regulatory framework for research involving human subjects is set up to protect privacy, how do we know when to impose an ethical framework? And when and how do we balance the application of a framework with truth-seeking, the public interest, and free expression? So what do we do with data that is not technically private, but we feel might be sensitive? As we saw in the Gamergate research, the bringing together of public social media messages can serve as a signal boost for hate messages and misinformation. The mere act of compiling these tweets make these messages and the targets of the messages more easily discoverable. Yet, in many cases, there is nothing private in this data at least as far as privacy is defined by state and federal laws. But aggregating these hateful messages can also boost the signal concerning views about which an author later has changed their mind. So we have to ask, what is our responsibility as researchers? Second, we should somehow account for the fact that creators of data might not understand what is protected by privacy law but might think that data they make available online should essentially still be treated as private. After all, it has been repeatedly demonstrated that the average user's expectations of privacy don't necessarily match with what the law says. So, do researchers bear an obligation to adhere to social norms or ethics to protect it? Mismatched expectations are a particular problem when data crosses international boundaries. Many big data research initiatives are international, and protections vary substantially depending on which national data protection regulation will apply. Research subjects may believe that the regulations of their home country protect their personal data, when in fact the requirements of another jurisdiction could apply once the data crosses a border. And third, how do we approach secondary uses of data that are not intended or predicted by their creators? For example, novelists did not expect for their words to be converted into data. But as Effie Vallena writes, many individuals do not understand the permissible secondary uses of information deemed to be public. In addition, website terms of service do not necessarily help inform people about potential secondary uses. So even setting aside the fact that authors may have had a different expectation of their audience or the ultimate uses of their writing, they also might not realize what they consented to in posting to a public platform. Take the pleaserobme.com project as an example of all these harms. Please Rob Me collected information about people's locations from both Foursquare and other social media posts. In 2010, the website demonstrated how users can inadvertently share information that compromises the security of their home by aggregating public tweets from users. The content in the post suggested that the user was not at home. In this case, the purpose of the website was to raise awareness of the potential for real-world harms, but it's easy to see how this concept could be exploited by bad actors. Even though the information about where people were at the time was public, People's expectation of privacy were colored by how obscure they viewed their social media account to be. If another individual mines Twitter accounts for a certain type of information and aggregates and links the information to the accounts of these users, 
then search cost has been dramatically reduced. The question arises, how should we account for this in TDM research design and publication? One contour to consider in deciding how to protect sensitive information is the notion of decontextualization. This is a photo an Instagrammer took at a restaurant when she ordered avocado toast. What do we need to be able to understand that this Instagram post is supposed to represent avocado toast rather than its deconstructed parts? This highlights part of the problem with the use of public yet sensitive data. The use of the information for research purposes is potentially stripped of an important narrative. Not only can this cause personal harm to the author, but in some cases can perpetuate harm to historically marginalized populations. As Kimberly Christian has explained, discovery replays a colonial paradigm where content is imagined as unhinged from peoples and cultures and free for the taking. She writes, quote, one can quite easily get content from a Google image search, scrape it from a website, or download it from an academic digital archive. The process is imagined as a neutral act, one of taking something that is already offered up for consumption. But this notion of data mining offers a telling example of how colonial legacies of collecting physical materials from local places and peoples are grafted onto digital content. Content is imagined as open, reusable, and disconnected from communities, individuals, or families who may have intimate ties to the materials. Again, the law does not stipulate a way to account for decontextualization. In addition to decontextualization, another factor to consider in deciding how to protect sensitive information in TDM research is the unequal power structures that enabled its creation or collection. Here, we can observe that big data collectors and researchers may be in a greater position of power than the big data generators, that is, the people who actually create the information or from whom the information is collected. This is a problem for a consent-based ethics framework because underprivileged groups may lack either the knowledge of how information about them will be used or the ability to intervene in that usage. The World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO for short, has developed, tried to develop international frameworks to protect communities, not just from having their traditional knowledge exploited, but also to protect them from overstudy and from not receiving the benefits of the research in some meaningful way. There's a tension here though, in that intellectual property laws and human rights frameworks are focused on individual rights and not group rights. In an article, legal scholar Ruth Ekedeji explains that absent a fundamental shift, the current types of rules will not facilitate realization of the economic, social, and cultural benefits envisaged envisage, and guaranteed by group rights. And without a move towards group rights, it is not really possible for marginalized communities to have real freedom to create, use, and enjoy knowledge assets. Okedeji argues that a move towards group rights strips away any pretense of neutrality and permits scrutiny of, or legal challenges to, private laws with distributive implications that undercut the ideals of human progress and development. In the absence of a group rights legal framework, we exist in the universe of determining whether and how to seek individual consent for research. So in the next video, we're going to turn to what a consent-based ethics framework means for TDM research.